As I begin the third part of my second round of this debate, I've yet another required intro. I accepted inmate 0645 2017's challenge and posted that first video explaining my three lines of evidence. And remember that the point of this debate was supposed to be him trying to rebut my evidence. So we obviously can't begin until I accept his challenge and post that video listing that evidence. And that was the first post of round one. He then posted seven 46-minute videos in his first round, wherein he failed to counter any of my evidence, though of course he doesn't realize that yet. I told him I'd be done with my second round on or by December 1st, though I have been delayed more than I expected by the holiday, and I expected him to let me finish my turn so that he at least know what my arguments are before he begins his second round of attempted rebuttals. But he's already posting replies to the videos I'm making now unaware that he's still repeating errors I have yet to correct. He also can't count because he skipped his second round. He thinks he's closing the third round already instead of beginning the second round prematurely. What's wrong with that guy? Yet, to those of you who aren't at all surprised, it's especially those who ask me why I'm wasting my time with this fraud, complaining that he's beneath me and all that, yes, I know that 0645-2017 is low-hanging fruit, and that he's not a challenge, that he doesn't represent anyone because even other creationists disassociate from him, and I know why they do. Of course I'm not going to change his mind. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. I know that, and he's already admitted that he's running this cult so that he won't have to get a real job. I heard about people that have to work for a living. I'm not going to do it. But he has a large following, and some of them still have the capacity for rational thought. They are my target audience. Besides, 0645-2017 is an example of the worst of all the advocates of Christian creationism and all that is wrong with America, and I've wanted to scrap with that con man for 20 years. So let me have my fun. I promise that soon I'll get back to my other series, which is more important, but I see this as an educational opportunity that I want to take advantage of. So I will continue posting to this debate until it's done, but not as frequently once I have my second round finished, because he still has to do his second round after I'm done, and then we both get another round after that. And with that out of the way... Good evening, folks. Ken Hoven here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventure Land. It is October 31st, 2018, and we're here to continue answering this, I guess it's the challenge that was accepted by Mr. R. Nelson, who goes by R. Ra. And uh, so we're going to continue with uh, try to get a little bit more in of his uh, diatribe and answer line by line what he said. We have some folks in the audience here that have joined us that like, I saw one of Arn Ra's Nelson's uh, videos where he wears a cape. So I'm going to be one of the, he's got the black cape. I got the white one. There you go. Really, we need the fan on for the hair. Fan on for the hair. Okay. Do I look cool? Do I... Do I look more intimidating? Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we will continue tonight. What we're going to do, like we did the last two broadcasts, is play and stop as necessary and interrupt and show where he gets uh, um, confused, I guess, on what different words, uh, how they apply. So. Here goes his uh, where we left off last night, I think. Okay. Believe that he ever attended any classes in any of them, and we know he didn't. He says we don't know if Hovind ever attended classes in any of those countries, and we know he didn't. I'm not sure how you know such a thing, Mr. Nelson, but okay. We know you didn't take any classes in paleontology because if you had, then you'd know why evolution is a science and not a religion. And you'd know that evolution is a theory of biodiversity that doesn't have anything to do with how the universe began, or where the elements came from, or how the solar system came together, or even how life began. You'd know that micro and macro evolution are both part of the same theory that only pertains to how living things diversify, and that's it. And before you can take classes in paleontology, you have to have some prerequisite courses, one of them being historical geology. If you'd ever taken a class in that, you'd know at least a few reasons why the layered sand toy you keep playing with is not an accurate representation of sedimentation. That is an oversimplification that ignores quite a lot. You clearly don't have any idea what you're talking about. You don't even know how much you don't know or how obvious it is that you don't know it. If you were a geoscience major, even in a creationist school like Wheaton Christian College in Illinois, 
you'd still know why the Earth cannot only be a few thousand years old, and you'd know many ways to prove that there was never a global flood. Even though Wheaton is a creationist school, their alumni assure me there are no flood geologists in their natural science department. They know better than that. I had two instructors in historical geology, and both of them were Christian. Yet on the first day, they said to the class, if you believe in Noah's flood now, you won't by next week. And they proceeded to show us the proof of an ancient earth. More importantly, if you'd ever taken classes on paleontology, you'd have to know something about evolution, meaning that you would have to know that evolution never taught and does not allow one kind to become a different kind. A species may evolve to become a new kind of whatever it was, but it can never become a different kind than its parent group, excluding naming conventions like wolves producing non-wolves that are still dogs. Evolution is descent with inherent modification, meaning that everything that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were, and thus belongs to every ancestral clade that their ancestors did. So dogs will still produce dogs even if they don't look like dogs anymore, and every new species of fruit fly or finch is still a fly, or it's still a finch. This is not a trivial error. You've based your entire career on repeating this one critical mistake that destroys your entire argument and all your credibility. You talk about building a house on shifting sand, but you're building a house on water, where every brick you lay down sinks before you can put the next one on top of it. You are repeating a straw man fallacy, not anything evolution actually is. If you'd ever had any formal instruction on this subject, you would know better than to say the stupid things that you keep repeating. So while you claim to have studied paleontology in 37 countries, we know you really didn't study anything anywhere because you don't exhibit any college level competency. You are obviously uneducated as every comment you make can only come from the mouth of ignorance and misunderstanding. Apart from believing that the Earth is only 6,000 years old and thinking... Wait, wait, wait. Apart from believing that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, Mr. Nelson, 6,000 is a long time. <laughs> long time. George Washington was president 200 and, what, 15 years ago. Columbus was driving around trying to find this place 500 years ago. The Vikings are running around beating up on folks 1,000 years ago. What do you mean only 6,000? 6, 6,000 is a long time. Long time. Just because you believe in long ago and far away, far away fairy tale millions of years stuff, that doesn't make it true. But don't stop saying only 6,000. Why don't you say God created the world 6,000 years ago? Whoa. For the same reason that you don't say that Columbus landed in the New World two hours ago. Whoa! Because that's how great the error is when you're off by a factor of 2.3 million. Because the concept of millions of years staggers human comprehension. That's what makes it impressive, because it's beyond our experience. There is nothing on this planet that is 13,000 miles away from where you are. So that's your frame of reference. But the distance from Earth to the Moon is close to a quarter million miles. So that exceeds your frame of reference, and it's thus impressive, being beyond comparison. But if we reduce everything by your factor of 2.3 million, then we could say that the distance from Earth to the Moon is 550 feet. Whoa! And it doesn't matter all the ways we can prove the real distance if you're determined to believe in fairy tales that say that the moon is less than 600 feet up, or in the expanse of a giant crystal firmament covering a disk world. There is no reasoning with one who admits that he has abandoned reason in order to believe in a fantasy, which by your own admission is not supported by any evidence at all. Hang the carbon-14 is used on Mesozoic fossils. Oh, there is no such thing as a Mesozoic fossil. The entire geologic column does not exist. There's no such thing as a Mesozoic era. There's no such thing as Triassic, Permian, Mississippian, Devonian. They're all rocks. And you put your interpretation on them based on which fossils are found in them. If it contains a dinosaur bone, it will be given the name Jurassic. If it contains a different bone, it's found something else. The, the rocks are assigned the strata, the name, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, based upon the kinds of fossils they find. And then the fossils are dated based upon the layers they're found. It's complete circular reasoning. That is another lie, one you can't really believe because you've revealed at other times that you know better. 
As you have already admitted, different layers do exist, and certain strata are identified by particular fossils that are only found in those layers. You can't explain that, and that already refutes your mythic flood, which we know for certain could not and definitely did not really happen. I've got a whole series citing professional scientists and the facts to prove that, but that's beyond the point here. The point here is that in the 19th century, these fossils that, were on, that are only found in specific layers were referred to as index fossils to tell the layers apart. And that's where we get the names Cambrian, Devonian, Jurassic, and so on. But the only way to date the layers was relative to each other, being aware that uh, one layer of dirt ha obviously had to be younger than the one below it and older than the one above it. Even your sand art toy shows that those layers had to go down in this order. However, we initially couldn't actually date the rocks because, as you well know, the fossils don't give any indication as to how old each layer is. The first attempt to date them was an attempt to date the age of the Earth as a whole. Lord Kelvin, who was one of Darwin's contemporaries and a critic of evolution in favor of intelligent design, used the laws of thermodynamics, which he devised himself, to conclude that the Earth and the Sun both had to be at least 20 million years old. Then he found out about nuclear fusion and the heat produced within the Earth by radioactive decay, and he was forced to push his estimates out much further. As you well know, there was a period of many years where the more these pioneers learned about radioactive decay, the older things turned out to be, until we now have several different concordant methods of radiometrically dating some geologic strata reliably, using radioisotopes rather than index fossils, so that it is not circular reasoning as you allege, nor is it interpretation because it is objectively verifiable. All of the textbooks will say there is such a thing as a geologic column, and they've got the names for them, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, etc. In the early 1800s, this was made up, completely made up. Up until that time, everybody thought, hey, the flood of Noah deposited all these layers. But then they began to realize just a few of the many reasons why your global flood could not and certainly did not happen. Just knowing that the Earth is a spheroid is enough to show the mathematic impossibility of your flood. So it was obviously just a fable, adopted and adapted from the legends of previous polytheism and exaggerated to impossible proportions, so that even in the 1800s, no serious geologist could seriously believe Noah's flood. And that was before we found Asher Burnaple's library and discovered that the story of Noah was taken from an earlier tale that was originally dedicated to other gods. All of those layers were formed in one year, as is demonstrated by polystrata fossils, petrified trees standing up. Wrong again, as always. You're repeating another one of those claims that was long known to be false. It might appear by the copyright that this claim was debunked a quarter of a century ago, but in fact it was debunked a century and a half ago in the first publication describing this phenomenon. A polystrate tree is here demonstrated by a lycopod. Now, these plants are related to today's club mosses, but this is an entirely extinct species that grew to 100 meters tall in the Carboniferous period. It has roots that have grown through what is now solidly compressed rock, which was obviously soft soil at that time, and then it evidently grew near a river system in which there were seasonal floods, creating numerous very thin layers around the base of this plant. As you can see by the illustration, this tree uh, grew through three noticeably different depositional environments, implying changing conditions where some periods were drier or wetter than others. And these type fossils can also be found with occasional deposits of volcanic ash or arid dust being blown in between recurrent periods of seasonal inundation. Because these are different layers of mud and silt washed up wet and then drying before the next layer comes, all while the tree is still growing here, to the point that it becomes this wide, we know that this could not have happened in just one year. You can't grow a plant this big in just one year. This took many years. Just the layers around it took many years, perhaps several decades until the tree died. And then the exposed part fell over and decayed or became part of the surrounding coal seams, while this part was protected from erosion and then got buried under further strata, implying two things. This took a long time, and it happened a long time ago. The geologic column is in all the textbooks, and they give them ages of so many millions of years ago, and it's all baloney. You see, it's a fact. The Earth has layers of sedimentary rock. We've got them here on our property. Come see the gravel pit, layers of gravel. The evolutionists have an interpretation that say the layers form slowly over millions of years. The creationists have an interpretation that say those layers are from the flood of the days of Noah. Now, you guys are always trying to erase this line, and assume, like you just did, make your interpretation part of the fact. It is not. It's a fact. The Earth has layers. 
It is not a fact. They're different ages by millions of years. A fact is a point of objectively verifiable data, and the different ages of the various strata can be literally absolutely verified to be in the millions of years. That is a fact. The geologic column is actually your Bible, Mr. Nelson. It can only be found one place in the world, and that's in the textbooks. I googled today, where can the geologic column be found? And they said there is a spot in North Dakota, but the layers are kind of thin. Don't know. You may have found these 10 uh, eras, these 10 layers, in that particular order in one or two places around the world. But the whole thing is based on the assumption that the layers mean something. That's not an assumption. Each layer gives unambiguous evidence as to what they mean. This guy, this textbook says, right over there on the shelf, if there were a column of sediments deposited continuously since the formation of the Earth, the entire history of the planet could be reconstructed. Unfortunately, no such column exists. The geologic column is a joke. It's a hoax. There is no geologic column. But they teach it like it's a fact. Like you saying, Hovind doesn't understand the Mesozoic era. There is no Mesozoic era. It doesn't exist, okay? If the geologic column existed in one place, it'd be 100 miles thick. By your own admission, yes, the geologic column does exist and can be seen, though usually only a portion of it at a time due to whatever has been exposed by uplift or erosion. Obviously, it would be hard to see all of it in one place because that would require a single erosional event to cut all the way through an area where every layer is represented because no erosion had ever occurred there before. Think about painting yourself into a corner. If you could see the entire geologic column, all of it at once, what would you be standing on? Now, I don't think anybody will argue. Yes, it's true, the Earth has layers. But if those layers are different ages by millions of years, why are there no erosion marks between the layers? I mean, they're stacked up like pancakes on top of each other. Don't you think if this layer sat there for 12 million years waiting for the next one, it's going to rain once in a while? Of course. In one of the upper levels of the Grand Canyon, for example, there are even fossilized raindrops along with the footprints of some primitive amphibian-looking thing both of which disprove the notion of the global flood, by the way. But in a dynamic environment, some places can be tropical rainforests, like uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, in the first few years of the 20th century. Then there was an earthquake that took the river underground, and the place became a desert rather quickly. So rain or shine, there are periods of different types of deposition alternating with different types of erosion, and we have to see which one prevailed in the balance, depending on which type of environment it is, or rather was, whether it's marine, aquatic, and forested, or a beach, or whatever. So, but this is what we used in the Scopes Monkey Trial. Is that black book right there, the black, about yay big, hardback book, this, um, the world's most famous court trial. The Scopes Monkey Trial, they nicknamed it. In this trial, the evolutionist defending evolution and trying to get the teacher out of trouble, he said, the lowest layers are obviously the oldest. No, that's not necessarily true. You're starting with a false assumption. Example, when I was preaching in Union Center, South Dakota, middle of no place, we went to Rapid City, South Dakota, to the School of Mines. We're given the tour of the mine around the, uh, of the museum, and the guide stopped by the geologic time scale right here. I was there just a few months ago. It's still there. And he said, folks, this layer of rock right here is 70, and they, they always get the sanctimonious tone in their voice, 70 million years old. Oh. My daughter was 12 years old at the time. She said, uh, sir, how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, we determine the age of the layers by the fossils they find in them, and that is exactly correct. Scientists use index fossils to determine the age of rock layers. So when you give your rebuttal to this, would you please tell me how you know a rock is Mesozoic without using any fossils? Radiometrically dated igneous rock from around the world repeatedly and consistently pinpoint the multiple layers of the Mesozoic strata as those lying between 252 and 66 million years old, being between two extreme extinction events. The KT boundary, attributed to a comet impact, as indicated by a massive crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, marks the end of the non-avian dinosaurs. And their reign began sometime after the Great Dying, which was the worst extinction event in geologic history, where not only fossils but even evidence of soil horizons disappeared from much of that strata. And while you can't always get absolute dates from sedimentary rock, you can date igneous rock, and the Siberian traps 
are a continent-sized flood basalt eruption on a scale beyond anything seen in human history. Their absolute date matches the geologically abrupt depravity of fossils seen worldwide from that time. And there's quite a lot of other supportive evidence you don't care about, but that should be enough to answer your question. They didn't have, this was all made up in 1830 before there were any dating methods. Carbon dating, potassium argon, rubidium, strontium, lead 208, none of those had been thought of. So you admit that the earth really has layers and that each of these layers have their own collection of fossils that only occur in those layers. So if that's real and can be verified as you say, then what did they make up? And like I said, the names of the geologic strata came from the fossils found therein, but the ages of the strata weren't determined until these radiometric dating methods were invented. And these are objective verification, yet you're pretending even after that that they're still made up? It sounds like you're making things up, since it turns out that you knew about radioisotopic dating when you pretended or wanted your supporters to believe that the ages of geologic strata were determined only by index fossils. No, you obviously knew better than that when you lied about it. Index fossils can only provide relative dates. Radioisotopes provide absolute dates. That's how the U.S. Geological Survey determines the ages of all the currently exposed to the surface strata in any given area. Here's a geologic map of your state of Alabama. I'll put a link below with explanations and a key for geological maps for all 50 states. And bear in mind that these maps are largely produced by and for fossil fuel exploration, a multi-billion dollar annual industry. So these have to be accurate and more reliable than any criminal carnival cultist at Dinosaur Adventureland. Anyway, we walked around the other side of the dinosaur here, and the Zuglodon, I believe. No, a Zuglodon is a four-flippered whale not a dinosaur, and that's not a zoogladon or a dinosaur. That's a mosasaur, which is a lizard, and lizards are distinctly different from dinosaurs, as I'll explain in a moment. And my daughter said, or the guide said, now folks, these bones are a hundred million years old. My daughter, 12 years old, raised her hand again. She said, sir, how do you know the age of those bones? He said, honey, we tell the age of the bones by which layer they come from. She said, uh, excuse me, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? That guy had a strange look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. If I can believe anything you say, and I don't, then congratulations for having found a stupid tour guide. But you began this anecdote as an attempt to prove that a higher level of sedimentary rock could somehow be deposited on a younger layer that wasn't there yet or maybe that a younger layer somehow forced its way under an older one above it, neither of which is possible, so you failed to make your point. He said, you're right, that's circular reasoning. Finding particular fossils indicates the age of the rock in which they are found. How do they date the rock? By the fossils. How do they date the fossils? By the rock. Circular reasoning, I call that stupid. I cannot think of a better word, I'm sorry. My mama would get mad, but she's up in heaven right now saying, son, you're right, that's stupid, okay. And they themselves will admit it. This one on page one page says, the layers of rock can be determined, or can be dated by the types of fossils they contain. Next page in the same book, Glencoe Biology over there, says, scientists determine the relative times of sequence and disappearance of many kinds from the location of their fossils in the sedimentary rock. So they date the rocks by the fossils, date the fossils by the rocks. Mr. Nelson, that's dumb. Dumb. And if you went to paleontology at Dallas, the University of uh, Texas in Dallas, and they taught you that, they taught you something that was dumb. You should not have swallowed that. You should have been smart enough to ask a question. Excuse me, teacher, this seems like circular reasoning. I am smart enough, but I didn't have to ask the question because unlike you, I can tell when we're talking about relative dates or absolute dates. I've never seen a textbook as circular as you describe, and I can't get online access to a high school textbook from a quarter century ago, but I looked up the current editions of Glencoe Biology and saw that just as I suspected, they describe relative dating, just like the passage you just quoted, and then they explain radiometric dating too. That's both in the textbook and the associated classroom lectures. I even found flashcards associated with Glencoe Biology, and these two explain relative dating and the difference between that and radiometric dating. And I've already seen creationists make this argument of circularity even when there's an explanation of radiometric dating posted right there in front of them. So I'll bet your edition of that textbook explains that too. The intelligent layman, this is American journalist science, 
has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. Ah, it cannot be denied from a strictly Encyclopedia Botanica. Mm -hmm. It cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint. Geologists are here arguing in a circle. The secession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks. So they determine how they evolved by where they're found in the rocks. And the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the organ remains of the organisms they contain. Oh, circular reasoning. Debating you is nostalgic. It takes me back to that 10 years I spent on Talk.Origins where the quotes you're citing from J.E. O'Rourke and Niles Eldridge were already listed on the Creationist Quote Mine project, noting where you had specifically taken quotes out of context, ignoring, for example, where Niles Eldridge explained a few paragraphs later that there is no problem of circularity. Now, these articles refer to this one, which says that the unfortunate part of the natural process of refinement of timescales is the appearance of circularity if people don't look at the source data carefully enough. Most commonly, this is characterized by oversimplified statements like the fossils date the rock and the rock date the fossils. Even some geologists have stated this misconception in slightly different words in seemingly authoritative works. So it is persistent, even if it is categorically wrong, which it is for the reasons I have already explained. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology as opposed to paleontology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So don't tell your listeners they, they know, now know by carbon dating. Of course it's not on carbon dating. Carbon dating can only range to about 50,000 years. So in anything older than that, they have to use one of these other dating methods. And I, I remember 20 years or so ago seeing multiple people correct you on this very point. More recently, I remember seeing Potholer54 correct you on this point too. So why don't you ever learn? Why can't you correct your mistakes? And like I said, radiometric dating is typically used on igneous rocks. So in different parts of the world, ancient lava flows may be found between sedimentary layers identified by index fossils. The absolute dates of layers below and above specific sedimentary layers identify a range of ages for the sedimentary deposits, not just for that location, but correlated to other igneous deposits, establishing absolute dates for that layer of sedimentary strata wherever it appears in the world. And these layers, identified as they are by index fossils, which you admit is true, do in fact appear all around the world, which of course they wouldn't if they were all caused by a global flood. This can only happen over millions of years of evolution. Let's continue here. Hoven also thinks that reptiles never stop growing. Hoven thinks that reptiles never stop growing. Do reptiles ever stop growing? According to Indiana Public Media, the skeletons of most mammals reach a certain size and then stop growing. However, many animals, including some mammals, keep growing throughout their lives. Kangaroos, for example, just keep growing and growing until they die. Let me continue the quote here. Most fish, amphibians, lizards, and snakes are also indeterminate growers, which means they don't stop growing. Mr. Nelson, you said Hoven thinks reptiles never stop growing. No, Hoven knows reptiles never stop growing. Study your science, Mr. Nelson. Okay, But many reptiles, all reptiles today never stop growing until they die, of course. So don't say Hoven thinks that. That is a scientific fact. They don't. Neither do kangaroos, by the way. So study it out before you accuse me of being stupid about this. I have studied the facts, and you are inexcusably stupid. I was making a statement in two parts that you believe that since lizards never stopped growing, they eventually became dinosaurs, which is idiotic. I dabbled in herpetology once upon a time with a few exotic lizards, so of course I know about reptiles being indeterminate growers, just like human ears and noses never stop growing, yet we never turn into trolls because the growth rate slows down so much. And while my Malaysian water monitor can reach nine feet in length, they usually don't get much bigger than seven feet. They'll never get as big as Nile crocodiles, and a Jackson's chameleon will never get as big as the Verandid, no matter how long it lives. It certainly wouldn't be as big as a Triceratops, and could never be confused with a Triceratops, even if it could be that big. 
The first glance at their skeletons should tell you that. And that dinosaurs are just modern lizards that lived too long and got real big. No, I've never said dinosaurs are modern lizards. I, dinosaurs are reptiles, that's what the word means, dinosaur, terrible reptile, terrible, uh, so, terrible lizard. You're backpedaling now. Shall we listen to earlier comments? And lizards got huge. Did you know reptiles grow all their life? They never stop growing? I think before the flood, when people lived to be 900, the reptiles would get to be really big. Really big. I think dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. The word dinosaur means terrible lizard. And that would be a terrible lizard if it's about 80 feet long. You can buy these at the pet store today. It's called a Jackson Chameleon. Got three horns on his face. I bet something similar to that, if you let it live 900 years, it would get to be a Triceratops. Hmm? Jackson Chameleon is a very interesting little creature, has three little horns, looks like a miniature Triceratops. So is it the same thing as they're finding the bones of? I don't know, possibly. I don't think there's any way to know that for sure, unless they happen to find a Triceratops that is not fossilized, and certainly dinosaur bones have been found that are not completely fossilized, even some with blood vessels inside. So. Maybe there'd be enough there to do a DNA test. That'd be interesting. So I can't answer the question, but I certainly think it's, it's uh, uh, interesting, the resemblance showing that there uh, are that type of creature with three horns still alive today. So could it be? Probably. Mm, couldn't prove it. Okay. Yes, I can prove that dinosaurs are not lizards. And while it is true that Sir Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur to mean terrible lizards, or more accurately, fearfully great lizards, he did so with deliberately deceptive, religiously motivated agenda. Owen was a creationist like you, except that he wasn't like you. He knew stuff. In fact, he was the leading authority on paleontology in the world in his day. Though he was also cruel, crooked, and corrupt. He knew better than anyone from firsthand experience that the world was ancient and had seen many successive ages with different environments preceding the age of men. He had personally seen substantial proof of that. He also knew at first glance that dinosaurs were not lizards. The first dinosaur ever identified as such was Iguanodon, and when all they had were teeth and a bit of vertebrae, they thought it would look like a gigantic lizard, just like those cheesy old movies. But once they had a pelvis, all that changed because the legs of these animals were columnists, supporting the weight from directly beneath like mammals, on feet that pointed forward rather than splayed out like modern reptiles, and their skeletons were hollow like birds. Now, based on that, Owen classified the first three known dinosaur species as a group distinctly different from any other reptile yet known, and more closely aligned with crocodilians than lizards. And just so you know, Dinosaurs, pterosaurs, phytosaurs, and a slew of crocodilomorphs you can't even imagine are all in the archosaur branch of the reptile family tree, according to their physical characteristics. None of these have a parietal eye, for example, like lizards do. So plesiosaurs, placodonts, phenodonts, and lizards are all the way on the other side, being as far removed from dinosaurs as it is possible to be. Owen believed that God was an imperfect tinkerer who got better with practice, and that God would release new and improved models whenever the old ones wore out. And that meant that the more recent animals had to be the better ones. See, his religious convictions would not allow him to accept the evidence that dinosaurs and pterosaurs were warm-blooded, bird-like, and much more advanced, and more than a match for any modern mammal, and not just because they were bigger, but because pound for pound, they were lighter, faster, and more efficient than any mammal, which means that they certainly weren't lizards. Inside and out, dinosaur digestion, respiration, and reproduction was more like that of birds. This realization drove Owen to misrepresent the data, to deliberately lie about the evolution of birds, and to portray dinosaurs as cold-blooded, sluggish, lumbering beasts, even though his contemporaries were already proving him wrong about that. Eventually, he was dishonestly dismissed from the Royal Society for lies and plagiarism. But the stigma he promoted about the image of dinosaurs and pterosaurs persisted for more than a century. If you had ever studied paleontology in any country like you pretended, you'd know that dinosaurs cannot be mistaken for lizards, except by the uneducated laity proudly displaying their ignorance as if it were knowledge. That's why I said you are a laughably incompetent example of the Dunning-Kruger effect.
And that plesiosaurs had cartilaginous skeletons. Plesiosaurs had cartilaginous skeletons. When have I ever said that? A plesiosaur has bones. It swims in the water. Grab me the plesiosaur out of there, would you? Uh, out of the science center. No, plesiosaurs have bones. Is that one? Here we go. There you go. Thank you. And I got one here. They had, I've never, I don't think I've ever said they had cartilage in a skeleton. Why would you lie about me like that? I've never said any such thing. It had a skeleton. They find this bones of them all the time. Even when other creationists correct him on these things. Nobody's ever accused me of believing plesiosaurs have a cartilage in a skeleton. Nobody's ever correct. They don't need to correct me on that. I didn't say it. Where do you get this stuff <laughs> anyway? I got it from when Answers in Genesis called you out for persistently using false or discredited arguments, citing the fraudulent archaeological claims of Ron Wyatt and others, and refusing to correct yourself, being unable to even understand why you should. They went through quite a list of the things you were saying that even they knew were wrong, but that you kept repeating anyway. Specifically, they complained about you trying to misrepresent the carcass of a badly decomposed basking shark as though it were a recently deceased plesiosaur hauled up by a Japanese fishing trawler, and that you lied about someone testing proteins taken from that carcass when no such tests were ever done because no samples were ever taken. Apparently, you made all that up. And while attempting to reason with you, they had to point out to you that plesiosaurs were, of course, bony reptiles as opposed to having the cartilaginous cylindrical vertebrae of the shark you were trying to pass off as a plesiosaur. I don't know if that was out of ignorance or dishonesty, but I suspect it was both. So he has absolutely no paleontological comprehension or education. I have no comprehension or education in paleontology. It's possible to read books and learn things. You don't have to get a degree from uh, a secular university. I'll show you in a second here. Whatsoever. Even without graduating, I have better credentials than he has. You have an associate's degree. That's a two-year degree from a junior college, or was it was at the university? Uh, so while you were getting your degree, you did not have it, obviously, so you had a high school diploma. Listen to what he says here. At least my associate's in science degree is real. Associate's in science degree is real. I'm also a reverend, like he is, albeit for a better religion. Dudeism. And he got his doctorate the same way I got my ordination. He bought his Ph.D. from a mail order and didn't know he was even supposed to have a thesis first until he... Okay, this is not correct. When I got my doctorate in education, they were... A Patriot University was part of Hilltop Baptist Church in Colorado Springs. Many churches offer classes. They offered their classes by correspondence. I worked very hard for my degree. I don't know if you worked hard for yours or cheated or... I don't know. Some people do cheat for their degree. I worked hard for my degree. I took all the classes by correspondence, probably University of Texas, Dallas offers courses by correspondence and by internet. I would be willing to bet money that they do. Later, long after I graduated, Patriot Univers University moved out to Del Norte, Colorado in a double wide house. And they take pictures of that house and circulate it all over the place as if that means something. I should have, when I was up at Rutgers University, taken a picture. They had a Chinese, I think it was a Chinese language studies department. It was a under a stairwell. You open the door. There's a little bitty space with a desk and one secretary and a phone. That was it. Their whole Chinese studies department. If you could get a probably get a bachelor's or master's and PhD from Rutgers University from a cl janitor's closet, right? Yeah, but it's part of Rutgers. Okay, well. Patriot University is part of Colorado, and it's huge. <sighs> Gee whiz. Okay. He already had his followers calling him doctor. I did not He's let not anybody. I did not let anybody call me doctor. People can call me whatever they want. Okay, and they do. By the way, uh, I don't care. I, the doctor means nothing to me. This coming from the guy who calls himself and his website Doctor Dino and who also began this video calling himself doctor, just like he does at the beginning of every debate I've ever seen, except the one with me, as if he had a legitimate degree, which he does not have, because there are a number of requirements for a doctorate, one of them being that you must already have a master's degree from an accredited institution, preferably. Then you have to write a dissertation in which you present a substantial original contribution to knowledge. How's he going to do that? That dissertation must then be evaluated by academics and approved before you can be awarded a PhD. But Charlatan 0645 2017 did all that backward. 
He bought his PhD for a couple hundred dollars, if I remember correctly. And yes, there was some correspondence course, but it was with Patriot Bible College, an unaccredited degree mill, meaning that the degree is bogus, not meeting prescribed standards or requirements. That's why he's a charlatan, someone pretending to have a doctoral degree they have not actually earned. Then, when people asked to read his dissertation, he said it was private. Then he found out that a doctoral dissertation is a matter of public record. So he finally wrote one after the fact, and having no idea how to write a dissertation, he began with the words, Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I'll put a link below where you can get a downloadable copy and an explanation that, contrary to accepted practices in academia where doctoral dissertations are available to the public, 06452017 has consistently refused to allow his dissertation to be offered for public reprint or scholarly inquiry. So, nothing about Dr. Dino is legitimate. He's a charlatan, yet he calls into question that I actually studied biology, historical geology, and paleontology. If you studied those things from a teacher who believed they came from a rock, and who believe the layers are different ages, I'm sorry, I'm not impressed either. So if you studied those things from a teacher who was an idiot, that's going to make you into an idiot. I'm not impressed with that. And you're self-taught, which is like a positive feedback loop. So hopefully your statement will spark a thought in the mind of one or more of your followers. So you're claiming you studied all these things at the University of Texas in Dallas. Maybe you, maybe you did. Wonderful. But if they taught you evolution, you learned something that was wrong. I learned something I can prove to be right. There are people that study and get PhDs in Buddhism and they learn all about Buddhism and how to all the, do all the chants and how to wear the robe and all this stuff. You can get a PhD in Islam. You can get a PhD in underwater basket weaving, probably. So what? So I know this subject better than you obviously don't. And your 152 prior failures will not help you here. That means I'm taking classes with actual professors and working as a scientist, both in the lab and... You are working as a scientist, and all you have is a high school diploma. Are you admitting that a person with a high school diploma can be a scientist? It, he didn't have his associate degree yet. So while you're getting your associate degree, you were a scientist. Are you a scientist right now, Mr. Nelson? Are you, are you a scientist? Yes or no? Just, uh, we'll pause. Never mind, you're going to pause later. Okay. So you're working as a scientist, and all you have is a high school diploma. Okay, remember that, please. I'll, I'll rub your nose in that a time or two later if you keep accusing me of something that you shouldn't. I already had my associate's degree before I started at UTD as a geoscience major. But I was only there for one year before my job changed, such that I could no longer attend classes full-time and work full-time. But to your question, an apprentice works at whatever vocation they're training for without actually having that title until their training is completed. And now, as director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, I could say that I'm technically a taxonomist. However, while our goal is to have that project peer-reviewed, it's not there yet. So I have not yet met what I consider to be the minimum criteria. In the field, not just pretending to know everything already like he does. Pretending but to know everything? Listen to yourself, son. <laughs> Listen to yourself. Ah, okay, let's listen to this now. The way he spins it, my education can't measure up to his complete lack of any relevant training. Your education can't measure up to my lack of relevant training. Let me show you about education and what is necessary here. I just Googled people who were successful but did not have an education, never finished school. Well, they gave a list, 50 extremely successful people who never finished school. George Washington, President of the United States, never finished school. Abe Lincoln had a total of one year, total of one year of education, total of one, okay? Harry Truman, Grover Cleveland, Zach Taylor, Andrew Johnson, John Glenn, Barry Goldwater, Benjamin Franklin, Winston Churchill, John Major, Prime Minister of England, Robert Frost, Lawrence Nightingale, Buckminster Fuller, George Eastman, founder of Eastman Kodak, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's. None of these people had an education. Didn't even finish high school, most of them. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, Peter Jennings, News anchor for ABC, Christopher Columbus, T.D. Jakes, Joel Olstein, John D. Rockefeller, dropped out of high school, didn't want to finish. Carl Rove, Ted Turner, uh, founder of the Communist News Network, CNN, <clears throat> Mark Twain, uh, you can go through and just Google, Andrew Carnegie, I'll just skip to a few of them here, Henry Ford, Paul Getty, Jack London, the author, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, you think he's kind of successful? How much money does he have? Billions. Huh? Billions. Billions, okay. Dropped out of school. Steve Wozniak, founder of Apple, Bill Gates, 
Ringo Starr. Who cares? So don't tell me you have to have some kind of education. I think I'm going to have to disagree with that, okay? Well, doctor, thanks for finally admitting that you have no education. But if you're going to debate a topic, you need to know something about that topic first, and you clearly don't. So, yeah, you either need an education before you begin this debate or you're going to fail like you're already doing. And we really haven't even gotten started yet. Hoven says he was a high school science teacher for 15 years, but he's never worked in any high school. You are lying through your teeth, son. I was pastor at Bethel Baptist Church in Pekin, Illinois on Broadway, and I started a Christian school. We had about 80 students, and I taught there. I resigned from there and moved to Kankakee, El Bourbonnet, Illinois, at Faith Baptist Church and worked in their Christian school. I was the math and science teacher. Pastor Gray then left and moved to Texas and kept calling, Kent, I need you down here. I need your math skills in our school in Longview, Texas. I taught at Longview Christian Academy for five years, and, one of the, and I taught in the college, Texas Baptist College. <clears throat> one of the students in the college was from California. He told his dad, who was a pastor of a church in Fairfield, California, Calvary Baptist Church on Gregory Street, 600 Gregory, Dad, you've got to get this guy to come out and work in our school. He knows his math and science. And so they kept calling and saying, would you please come out here? So finally, my wife and I flew out to California to Fairfield and accepted the job to work at Calvary Baptist Christian School in Fairfield, California, where I was for about three years. And then we moved to Pensacola, Florida, where I worked at East Hill Christian School before I finally started my own ministry. Mr. Nelson, you're lying about me. I did teach. I've never said it was public schools. I've always taught in Christian schools. I've spoken in many public schools and intend to get in more. If you're wondering why 06452017 never, ever divulged what schools he taught at so that all we could find out about him were reports that he taught creationism in churches, he explains. The reason I've never mentioned until this broadcast which schools I taught at is because I know some of you morons are going to go try to check out that school and try to try to draw attention away from the fact that I taught school. You're looking for any excuse. Well, that's just a small school. They've only got 200 students. You, you, watch. That'll be in the comment section on this one. I think the reason you've never mentioned where you taught is the same reason you bought your bogus doctoral degree. So you could appear to be educated when you're obviously not. Because every state requires all public school teachers to have at least a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution, especially for science teachers. We all know that Christian schools obviously don't have such lofty standards if they let you teach there. And saying you teach science in a Christian school is an oxymoron. At least if it's a creationist school, because then it means you don't actually teach real science. And not just because you censor everything, but because you certainly don't teach methodological naturalism, which is the core of the scientific method. There is no value in bragging that you teach science in a Christian school, because then no one expects you to know any more than you obviously don't. And you can pick an, make another video of your next best three evidences for evolution. <clears throat> and we'll do the same thing again. I don't think we'll get that far. I don't I think Hovind is going to face plant in the very first round like he did in our previous meeting. Hovind's going to face plant in the first round. This is my third video going up tonight here, Mr. Nelson. I don't think I face planted on any of them. Because he can't get through this knowing as little as he does. Especially not when he has to follow the same rules that I do. And now that we got the preliminaries out of the way, I guess the debate starts now. Yeah, I lost the pause button. Here. Aaron said, no matter how oh, there it is. Okay. you think you know it, if you can't right. show it, then oh. you don't know it. Rewind, start over. And you should okay. say yeah. that you do. Ten seconds, just hit that rewind, 10 second arrow right there next to the play button. Oh, okay. Go 10 more. Yeah. Knowing as little as he does, especially... Knowing as little as I do... I've done 151 debates. If you want to count this one, to be 152. Go watch some of them. Everybody else watches them and says, wow, this guy knows his subject. I think I do know my subject. What do you mean knowing as little as he knows? I mean that everyone I know of who watches your videos is impressed with how ignorant you are, that you obviously don't even know what evolution is when you're trying to argue against it. Only creationists believe that complex interdependent systems and organisms poofed out of nothing. Whoa, 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 no. The evolutionists are the ones who believe all these complex systems poofed out of nothing. Oh, yeah. Let me show you. Okay. 
Mr. Nelson, for the last 61 broadcasts on my channel, I have been talking about different creatures. I just drew one up randomly talking about the ant lion. So this is clear back from letter A, okay? But you can see these quotes on all of them. According to your religion of evolutionism, the ant lions came from a dot of nothing that exploded. This is University of Oregon. They are showing a drawing how the Big Bang is where nothing exploded and turned into the guy doing the Valsalva maneuver. I'm sorry, rapidly expanded. The most important information that few people know, the universe is 13.798 billion years old, with a sphere diameter of 93 billion light years. How they know that? If light, unless light traveled faster than light, that's another topic, never mind. Virtual particles that convey temporary mass continuously pop in and out of existence in the empty space, the nothingness between the quarks. 90% of you, including ant lines, is nothing. The universe formed by matter and condensing out of the energy an inflating singularity 13.798 billion years old ago. You came from energy. You are energy. All matter came from energy. The inflating singularity that formed the universe came from nothing. Only creationists believe we came from nothing. Uh, this guy's University of Ohio, Mr. Nelson. Okay. The singularity was an unstable ultra-high energy virtual particle that spontaneously appeared out of the nothingness of a quantum vacuum. You came from nothing. Everything comes from nothing. Wow. Hi, I'm James St. John, University of Ohio. How about Alan Guth? The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Why would you say only creationists believe it poofed out of nothing? Because it's true. Victor Stenger, Lawrence Krauss, and Sean Carroll have all redefined nothing such that it is not the absolute philosophical nothing that creationists believe in that it is instead at least a vacuum state in a quantum field, which is actually something that could either be empty space, where at least space exists and energy can be stored according to laws of physics like general relativity, and the universe neither has nor necessarily needs a beginning, being infinite in both directions. Now, the concept of the singularity, as previously described, seems no longer in favor, I'm happy to say, though this is a recent change and your references tend to be decades out of date. But if there was a cosmic inflation from a single event where there was nothing, not even space-time, as had been previously opined, then, as I alluded before, that could well be a fourth spatial dimension inflating our three-dimensional space, or space-time, and that the source of all that material energy would be another source in the multiverse, so that even if we started with nothing, everything would still have come from somewhere else, being both something and eternal. In my favorite cosmological model, which again is always subject to updating when new ideas or data come in, the universe doesn't have a beginning, it does not come into existence at a moment in time, it always existed, it looks different from moment to moment, and we are only observing a tiny part of it, so we don't even know what the whole thing looks like. But there is no need for an explanation to cause a beginning, something coming to existence out of nothing. Then you want to get into the primordial soup, I got plenty of quotes on that, I do this every night in my broadcast. Here's your theory. Nothing exploded and made everything. Then the Earth cooled down and a rocky surface was created. As the Earth formed, the surface was hot like the moon. There were hard, large pools of bubbling lava. There was no oxygen, but the rocks absorbed it anyway. I never understood that one. Your reading skips, omits, or misrepresents everything. And some of the oldest fossils are stromatolites formed by cyanobacteria, which produce oxygen as a waste product. After more than a billion years of such colonies all over an evidently anaerobic world, their oxygen was absorbed into the sea, then into the rocks, and finally into the atmosphere that we breathe. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. Swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, it sure is. It's completely stopped. Doesn't happen at all. Never happened. Life on Earth may have begun in rocks on the ocean floor more than four billion years ago. Though that is not any of the hypotheses that I'm familiar with, it is an important distinction of life forming in the rocks rather than coming from rocks like you imagined. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. This is exactly what the textbooks teach. So it's not the seas becoming soup because of the rain and the soup coming alive like you tried to say before. The Earth began as a hot ball of rock. About 3.9 billion years ago, Earth had cooled enough for water vapor to condense. The Earth was, for the first time, experiencing violent rainstorms. Eventually, the accumulated rainfall formed Earth's oceans. It is in these oceans, 3.5 billion years ago, the scientists believe the first living organisms appeared.
just poof out of the soup. 13.798 billion years ago, Big Bang. Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. Rained on the rocks for millions of years. Turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. So there's Grandpa. This is exactly what you teach, that nothing formed everything. Don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I, this is exactly what you guys believe. So, Mr. Nelson, let's go on with your uh, diatribe here. With inherent modification, meaning... There you go. You're wanting to define evolution as descent with modification. You're, you are completely baffled. There are six different levels to this. Descent from what? You're going to skip living organisms coming from the soup. They, that's what the textbooks teach. You're going to skip the... Where did matter itself come from? How did the stars get there? How did life get started? Descent with modification is only going to give you varieties of dogs. It's not going to change a pine tree to a dog. It's not going to change an amoeba to a dog. You're d selecting your own wording definition of the word evolution to get out of the obvious. Your theory's dumb. <laughs> the whole theory includes much more than that. Genetic modification, variable only. Genetic modification, well, then you already got to have a gene code. Well, then the gene, the gene code itself is phenomenally complex. Study some genetics. You think the gene code happened by chance? If by chance you mean that it wasn't intelligently designed for an intended purpose, then of course it could not have been and obviously wasn't deliberately designed. It is an incidental chemical construct illustrating properties of emergent complexity. What is the chance of lightning striking a computer and creating a whole new program like PowerPoint? Better than my ability to teach you what evolution is, apparently. But I do this for those on the sidelines who may still be able to think. I consider it immoral to deceive people the way you do, because religious belief stifles the ability to comprehend and critically examine, to understand. The people have the right to believe in lies if they want to, but they also have the right to be told the truth first. I've seen you say that you accept that this happens, and that you even accept speciation, though of course you don't realize that counts as macroevolution. No, Mr. Nelson, speciation does not count as macroevolution. Yes, it definitely does. And what do you know? The terms micro and macroevolution were first coined in 1927 by Russian entomologist Yuri Filipchenko. It was an evolutionary biologist who invented these words, so science is the authority on what they mean. According to universities actually teaching this subject, microevolution is variation within species and macroevolution is variation between species. That means that the emergence of new breeds or subspecies is microevolution, but the emergence of new species is macroevolution. Creationists refuse to admit that that's what it means, but if you don't believe me, look it up. Macroevolution is evolution on a scale of separated gene pools. Macroevolutionary studies focus on change that occurs at or above the level of species, in contrast with microevolution, which occurs to smaller evolutionary changes, typically described as changes in allele frequencies within a species or population. Macroevolution is major evolutionary transition from one type of organism to another occurring at the level of species and higher taxa. Evolution that results in relatively large and complex changes as species formation. And even though each of these is reasonably accurate, you can't always trust common dictionaries for lay people when they're trying to talk science. So sticking to scientific sources, let's start with the University of California Berkeley's online primer called Evolution 101. Macroevolution refers to evolution of groups larger than an individual species. Speciation turns one species into two and is thus macroevolution. We get the same definition from Duke University. Evolutionary patterns and processes at and above the species level. And from the University of South Carolina, Beaufort, macroevolutionists, that's a stupid word, study the processes that cause origination and extinction of species. And from Stanford University, microevolution is defined as changes within a species that aren't drastic enough to create an entirely new species. Changes that result in a new species are part of macroevolution. Now let's look at the reference website Biology Online. Macroevolution involves variation of allele frequencies at or above the level of species. So, that's just one more thing you're wrong about. Macroevolution is properly defined as the emergence of new taxa at or above the species level, just like I said. You already agree that speciation happens, so you accept both micro and macro evolution, or you would if you knew what they are. 
At both levels are the same mechanisms of population genetics which explain the diversification of species but do not allow for your fantasy distortion of one kind producing another kind that isn't even related to its parents. That's a stupid mistake on your part that you've been re repeating for the entirety of your life, but you're going to need to correct that immediately.